I'm Shirley Fawar, and this is On the Spot Career Talk. And today I am talking to one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Patrick Chad, and he is going to talk to us in regards to his occupational choice, or I would say occupational choices, <laughs> and his career journey. Hi, how are you today? I'm very good. How are you? I am well. I am well. I am so excited about interviewing you because you have a long process that needs to be told and today's the day. <laughs> I've been oh looking forward to this. <laughs> so tell me, you know, as uh, employers is asking that question to our students and we're saying, okay, this is how you prepare. And we always ask them that wonderful question. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I want to know your journey. How did it all begin for you? So my journey has been interesting. Uh, it certainly did not start out with any kind of education except for high school. Uh, my family's all blue collar. Uh, my father was engineer. I had plans of being a graphic artist for Hallmark and that was my biggest aspiration in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. So I'm half Japanese, half German Irish and my dad is American from um, Lincoln and my mom's from Japan. I grew up overseas um, in Japan. I was born in Korea and did some time in Vietnam when my dad was stationed there. And I came to the U.S. when I was 12. And I ended up in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I went to uh, a Japanese first grade and then an international um, first grade where I learned English, Vietnamese, French, because my first language was actually Japanese. Wow. And then when I ended up in Nebraska, um, I went from sixth grade through high school in Lincoln, so Goodrich Junior High and Lincoln High School, where my father and my grandfather went. So we have a long history uh, in Lincoln, and, and I'm related to every Chad that is in Lincoln. So, wow. um, so then I went to um, Lincoln High School, and after in between high school, after our we, they had a program in the Army, and I believe they still have it, that you leave your junior year for basic training. And then you get your basic training, you get all your hair shaved off, and then wow. they send you back for your senior year bald. You go through your senior <laughs> year, and, um, um, and then you go to your advanced training. So I was in the Army Reserves. I was a um, administrative clerk in a cavalry tanker unit, and I was with the Army Reserve for 13 years. So when I came back to Lincoln, um, I was working in a deli. I love to cook. It's one of my hobbies, one of my passions, and it was a, a second career choice should the graphic design card design thing didn't work out. But once I got back from the military, another avenue opened up for me, which is with my military background, um, I could actually work at the prison. So I saw an ad in the paper for correctional officer and all my friends were saying, yeah, there's no way that you're going to get hired to be a correctional officer. Oh, my goodness. So I'm one of those people that when they tell me I can't do something, <laughs> you're I uh, try. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, oh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do it. Right, right. <laughs> so really no aspirations to be in law enforcement or corrections. But I went and applied and they said, oh, you've been in the military. You are um, 18 years old. We will definitely hire you to be a prison guard. So I hired on with the Nebraska Department of Corrections, went through the training, and I worked at Lincoln Correctional Center as a prison guard for five years. And we did everything from um, maximum security to mental health to work release, um, just a regular prison. So during that time, I thought, this isn't too bad. I really like it. But after five years, I got a little bored. I was wanting to leave Lincoln to kind of spread my wings. And my sister lived out on the East Coast. So she lived in Pennsylvania. I thought, you know what, let me go visit her. Visited my sister, found out that um, there was a, a prison in Chester County. She lived in Westchester, Pennsylvania. So Chester County Prison. I checked it out when I was visiting her, put in an application, went back home. They called and said, hey, we'll hire you. So I packed up bag and baggage. I drove across the country and I moved to Westchester, Pennsylvania, where I became a correctional officer for five years. So at that point, I had about 10 years of experience as a correctional officer. Got bored again. Right. And the proximity to Philadelphia and Wilmington was nice. Both cities had an advertisement for police officer. 
Okay. So I went to both. Um, I got applied, accepted to both. I decided that I really didn't want to be in Wilmington. And uh, I thought Philadelphia is a big city. It's exciting. So I went through the Philadelphia Police Academy and graduated in um, 1990 and became a municipal police officer. And I was there until um, 2000. And at that point, um, my family wasn't thrilled that I was a police officer. I loved it. I still love it. I still miss it. And they said, you know, what would you do if you had the option to do things all over again? And, and just so you know, I had only taken one year of classes at um, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln when I was, you know, 18, 19. And I just didn't finish because I got this great job at the prison. I was making a ton of money. And I thought, I'm not going to suffer. Like, I've got a new house. I've got a new car. And just, you know, it was a great life. I was making great money for my age had a relationship and all. So um, anyway, so back to after I finished my um, police career, I thought, you know what, I really would like to try graphic art again or go into some kind of art because that's always sort of been a core of who I am. I love art. I do all kinds of things from painting to sculpture to jewelry making. So I signed up for my um, associate's degree at the Art Institute of Philadelphia. And it was a great fantastic program. I loved it. And it taught me skills that I actually um, use to this day. So, you know, I don't have any kind of snobbery over the type of institution, whether it's community college, you know, an art institute. I mean, That's education's right. education, and it will take you far. That's right. So I got my associates. And after I got my associates, my family was like, hmm, you know, well, you may want to get your bachelor." you know, because you've got your associates and it's only a couple more years. Mm -hmm. So I left the police force. I got a job at a software company as a web developer and graphic designer in Lower Marion. And I thought, you know what, I'll just do it part time online. And it was early in the online um, education arena. So I started. It took me seven years to complete my bachelor's because I was lazy, because I was working because I was in a relationship and, it, and education was never really important to me. And I just felt like it wasn't attainable. So like I said, none of my family had graduated college. Um, I was a first gen student. Mm -hmm. And so I went through the process, finally got my bachelor's degree and that was the catalyst, I will say. Um, when I got my bachelor's degree, I suddenly felt like I had accomplished something. I felt really proud. And I just had this euphoria of, how cool is this, right. you know? And, um, and it was eye-opening. It was life-changing. It was eye-opening. And I thought, this is fantastic. So at the time, I had left the software company. I was working for myself as a graphic designer, uh, freelance from home. I even had, for a short while, a, um, a store in Haddonfield where we did home goods and, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, I'm just sort of curious. I love to explore every interest I have. Right. So, um, so I had my bachelor's and I got a, um, someone told me about a job at a nearby DNJ, the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Right. So the position was for instructional designer. Mm -hmm. So I applied for that position and um, my boss, my future boss who interviewed me, said, welcome to the interview. Um, I'm not gonna hire you for this position. Mm. I have to interview you because of HR and I have to interview three candidates. Wow. I have two candidates that outqualify you. They have their master's degree. Mm. And at that point, I was just finishing, I just I had just finished my bachelor's degree. So she said, but I have to interview you. So right. let's get on with it. I was like, okay. For this interview, since it was a medical school, I didn't bring my graphic um, design book. I thought, you know, there's no sense in my bringing pretty pictures or ads or, or, or layouts to this interview. So I tried to kind of focus on what might be important or pertinent to that job. And since it was a medical school, I created a single, I talked to a couple of friends who were doctors. I created a single lesson on aortic stenosis Mm. I still have no idea what that is. I know it's a heart condition. Um, and I created a web page. I created um, audio content, video content, 
uh, flash content, different types of programming. I put it on a CD. I packaged it. I designed the package, and I made 10 copies of this self-running CD lesson on aortic stenosis. So I said to her, well, I didn't bring my, my book, but I did bring this CD on aortic stenosis. If you want to take a look, that's great. It's self-running. And this was 1997. So kind of early on in the CD authoring piece. Yeah. She's like, okay, we hit it off. It was a great interview. And she said, I'm so sorry that I can't hire you. I think you're really nice. I think it's great. Um, good luck. Mm. And so I left. But, you know, for the interview, I dressed in shirt and tie, jacket. I mean, just tried to look really professional and, and presented myself in the best manner possible. Mm -hmm. About two or three weeks later, I get a call and she said, are you interested in the job? Wow. And I said, well, Susan, I didn't think you were interested in hiring me. Right. She said, well, she said, I actually passed your CD around and everybody said, you really have to hire this person because um, at that point, instructional design was just really kind of getting off the ground. Ed tech was getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. They said, you want an instructional designer. We need to start bringing some technology into the school. So, you know, so she offered me the position. Within a year, my boss decided that she no longer wanted to be in a leadership position. And she recommended me as the interim director. Wow. So that caused a little bit of tension with my coworkers. But we managed to work it out. And from 1998 to 2013, I grew that three-member team into three teams of 17 people. So there was academic technology where I started, multimedia services, which was the old educational media group that I brought in, and then also support services, which was our desktop support unit. At the time, did you know your worth? Were Not you at know? all. So you were able all. to negotiate your salary, even though she told you she wasn't going to hire you, and then she followed up and hired you. Did you negotiate additional money? Not at oh, all. Oh my goodness! So for my first job, it <laughs> was like um, I went from working for myself at home freelance to making sixty-five thousand dollars a year. Okay. I was like benefits sixty-five thousand. Yeah, you didn't care at that point. I didn't care. <laughs> Um, and I wasn't even looking for the job. I was like, this is great. great. So my two co-workers actually had master's degrees. Mm -hmm. And so my spouse said, hmm, you know, you're managing two people with a master's degree and you only have a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. You may want to think about getting a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? I have the title of instructional designer. Really didn't know what it was, didn't deserve the title because I had no idea what it was. I just knew what I was doing. Right. So I applied to an instructional design program at UMass Boston. I got accepted. Okay. So at the school, I was helping the uh, New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging develop a virtual patient module using flash and computer design. And it was to help students go through this simulated virtual patient case. Okay. So that was my capstone. Some accolades and some hate from my classmates. Friendly hate. It was like, <laughs> oh, man, are you, are you for real? <laughs> so I got through the capstone, got through the program. I got my master's in education for instructional design. So suddenly I felt like, you know what? This was cool. And I have to say, as much as the bachelor, as much, so I love my associates. Right. The bachelor's for me was a struggle, even though I loved it. And my bachelor's is in graphic design, also from the Art Institute. Right. Then I went to UMass Boston. I got my MED in instructional design and I loved it. I loved every moment of it. It was cohort based and I'm still friends with my cohort today. Like they come nice. visit and yes. you know, it's been, it's been 10 years. So a year or two went by and um, my spouse was like, so, you know, I don't take, you know, it's that, you know, you have to or do this. I don't take that right, kind of pressure right. well. But these little seeds of, you know, you got your master's and you really liked it. Mm -hmm. You might want to consider maybe getting your doctorate. So at the medical school, I worked with a lot of doctors. Right. And, and doctors are a funny breed. They're intelligent and they're fantastic. But you almost, and I hate to say this, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but you almost don't have a voice in the room. 
mm. if you don't have a doctorate. That's true. Right? Yeah. And even though they knew me for all those years and knew, you know, what it was like to work with me and I had done all of this technology stuff, mm -hmm. I still had a master's and so I wasn't at the same level. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, um, let me give it some thought. Yep. So I applied to Rutgers. I was, um, I was accepted to the Rutgers program and um, it wasn't a good fit. So I think there's also the, the, the fit with education. Just didn't feel right to me. And I think Rutgers is a great school. I know a lot of friends who graduated from there. The program wasn't a good fit for me. And I was going to just quit and figure out what to do. I got some good advice. Mm -hmm. um, and I was told, look, don't quit the program. You've been accepted into a graduate program. Right. So take a break. Mm -hmm. During that break, I applied to other programs. And I started thinking about what I really wanted to do. So my original doctorate was in design of learning environments. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know what? I don't think I want to do this. Mm -hmm. So I found a program at Creighton. So I'm from Nebraska. Creighton is a Jesuit school in Nebraska, in Omaha, about 50 miles from my hometown of Lincoln. And I thought, you know, this way I could go see family. That's right. I could go to school. And it just felt right. It was like a 360 kind of going back home. Yeah. And the program was a doctor of education in interdisciplinary leadership. So it was business, healthcare, education, all things that I currently did in my job. Mm. Um, by the grace of God, I got accepted to the program. Yeah. So once I got accepted to the program and I was locked in, I left the Rutgers program and started right into the Creighton um, interdisciplinary leadership program and got through all of my coursework. I had started writing my dissertation mm -hmm. and my chair was very active. So she got, in, and I loved it. I loved the cohort. I loved the program. And we all met up for dinner in Philadelphia. And I was talking to her about my, my dissertation. Right. And she said, you know, Pat, she said, um, your dissertation only meets four of the requirements, four of the five requirements hmm. of the program. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God, because it's a it was a doctorate in it was an EDD, so right, right. Doctor of Education. It's a practical degree, it's not theoretical like a PhD. Okay. And so one of the requirements was is at the end of it, you had to have something, a framework, um, a yes. protocol, you had to have some actionable piece. Yes. And I was just like, oh dear God. Um, and this was in March of 2010. Okay. So it was a qualitative study, interviews. Yeah, so I sat I down. <laughs> I like those two. Right. Figured it out. Right. <laughs> and um, I actually then treated it like a project where every month I set myself a goal of a deliverable. I got the new research approved mm -hmm. and ran it by my committee. My committee signed off on it. For me, it really was joyful. I really enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm, I realized that I'm also, I was a better student as an older person. I had retired from the police force before I started my educational journey. So I was 40, I was over 40 okay. before I got my bachelor's. Right. You know, that's and important. That's important for the people in the community to know that everybody you can start anytime. Exactly. Exactly. Now, how did you transition in that? I heard you talk about, you know, family, how they encouraged you uh, to move forward in that. But in, I would say, looking in self, how did you transition through that? Because sometimes we're harder on ourselves and um, there's, there's certain tapes that we have. That's the reason why we never pursued it prior. So what was yours? So the reason my bachelor's took seven years in all honesty was that that script was playing. You're a blue collar kid. Your family are construction folks, welders, home builders, electricians, plumbers, and certainly no shame in any of that. I mean, I, I embrace my blue collar background. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's a, a viable career choice for people who, you know, may not take the academic path. Right. And so for that seven years, I kept telling myself, I'm just not smart enough mm. 
to do this. I'm not built to do this. This is not who I am. Right. And of course, my father had always said, you are smart enough and you will be a college graduate. And in my rebellious, in, in my rebellious nature, I was like, what do you know? Right? Right, he right, right, right. He was right. So then when I got it done, it suddenly became all about me. I was like, I did it. This is so cool. And then suddenly that nebulous dream of being a graphic designer, I realized was attainable. Mm, how about that? Wow. You know, like well, it was always sort of a, I'm going to be a, right. but I never took the steps to get there. Right. So it was always this dream. And suddenly the dream was a attainable reality. Right. Much as I love my master's, my doctorate was like that much and more. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And the strangest thing, apart from being called doctor, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is that... Huge. That is huge. <laughs> it's huge. And all of my coworkers who were physicians and clinicians and, and doctors of education accepted me into their group on a different level. Mm -hmm. And as much as I hate to say it, I mean, they suddenly, yep. it was like they said, you know, oh, you have a voice in the room. You've done what we've done. Yes. And so now we are going to hold you in the same regard. So I commend you for going all the way. So if there's people out there right now who are in their 40s or their 50s, and they're thinking, well, I can't do this. This is an inspiration story to let them know you're young, you can do this at any age. Uh, if, you're, if you have the mental capacity, first of all, to be able to have that, um, that rigor of the you know, study time and all of that, um, and to be able to work. But that's wonderful that you were able to do both. Well, I had a lot of support, and I will say that since I've attained what I have, I've become an educational champion. I think the important thing, and it sounds so cliched, is that you just have to start. True. And just take one step at a time, one class at a time. Eventually, you're going to get to the finish line. Just take a class. Education transcends, you know, gender and color. And it can. You know, not saying that it, it solves all of those issues, but it certainly can. I'm a first-gen student. I'm biracial. I went from being you know, a, a police officer to an instructional designer to director of tech services. Mm -hmm. And then I worked at um, Temple as their director of educational technology. Mm -hmm. And while I was in my job at Temple for the last nine months, I got an offer to be associate dean of e-learning for Camden County College. Wow. So I accepted that. Mm -hmm. And this was never the plan. I had, I couldn't, if you would have told me at the beginning of my journey that this is where I would end up, I would have said, you're so crazy. Like, this is just not, you know, who I am. But it is. Sounds like you're in a great place right now. Yeah. And tell me about the, your job responsibilities. What is exactly do you do? So um, my job responsibilities at Temple as director of educational tech was I led a educational tech team and I worked at the Center for the Advancement of Teaching. So there are two sides to that unit. There are the faculty developers who really delve into pedagogy and how to teach. And, and we talk about evidence-based teaching. And then the educational tech side. And the, what we do is we look at what it is that faculty want to achieve. And we help them find tools, tech tools, that may help them do it better. And do a lot of webinars. We do training. We do one-on-one -on -one consults with faculty. Um, my new job, which is Associate Dean of E-Learning at Camden um, County College, is to get their e-learning division um, off the ground. And they do have 170 classes already online. Nice. And of course, in this, in this time, everybody's online. Mm -hmm. So my job is really to develop the e-learning division and to grow it and to really make it robust and a place for students, faculty, to really come together and learn, you know, what it is to teach online and to learn online. And um, I also bring interest in um, attracting first-gen students like myself. Absolutely. Um, 
-hmm. you know, students of every race. Mm -hmm. I think community college um, really speaks to me in the sense that it is very affordable. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of programs that they have. They're partnered with Rowan and Rutgers and Thomas Edison's. Well, you, your path, your journey, <laughs> really, I mean, if somebody said, this is the way you could do it, probably people would say, no, nah, you can't do it that way. But you did it. Yep. <laughs> and you based it not on the process of what had been done. You based it on what was best for you. Right. The direction for your family. That took over. You were successful in gaining employment because you focused on what it was you wanted. And it was almost like the universe said, well, here, here you, here you are. <laughs> so that's wonderful when we get focused about the purpose of our own lives. Now, are there any last um, little nuggets or little things you would share with the community on their career journey? I think that, um, I think that anything is attainable. And I think what's important is that you make sure you enjoy it. It shouldn't be a struggle. And I actually had someone say to me, aren't you in a doctoral program? And I said, yes. And they said, well, you know, you're not suffering enough. Mm. And I think that's a fallacy. I do not think that education should be painful or suffering. I think education should be an adventure and exploration and a journey of just joy. I think it's all about enjoying life. And I've, I've enjoyed my life and every job I've had yeah. To the fullest. I just want to say thank you so much for indulging us by telling us your career journey. It definitely will. It first of all inspired me. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we're always thinking about should I go back to school? Should I get additional certifications? Oh, I'm too old for this. Do I really want to do it? So I'm excited. I'm in, you know, I'm inspired. And I appreciate that. And I'm pretty sure that everyone who views this will also be inspired as well. Well, it seems like you have a great passion for what you do. I am very glad that you are around the table, that you actually have a seat <laughs> and that you can make good changes for the community. Um, I think there was one other question that I had for you. Can you please tell us, you love to cook, you love um, design, and you have an online YouTube. Can you share um, some of that information with our, our viewers? So I love to cook. I've always loved to cook. And that's why um, I actually was working at a deli before all of this started, before I went into the military, before my whole career path started. I could have been a caterer, actually. Um, but I, I love to cook. And for me, it's just an extension of being artistic. So I like to make bread. I like to make all kinds of food. And um, in talking to friends and family, they said, you know, you really should kind of think about doing some videos so that we know how to make some of your recipes. Absolutely. And that was for family and friends. Yes. And I thought, why not? So I literally just got, you know, a camera and started making videos, making recipes. My recipes, believe it or not, has like almost 70,000 views, which is crazy. Isn't that crazy? Um, it's crazy. <laughs> um, it's really about again, enjoying my life and doing what I love to do. So right. it's there for family and friends. And, and if other people like it and want right. to watch it, that's great. But, yeah. Wonderful. So you don't <laughs> mind me advertising it underneath of this? No, not at all. View it. You never know. You, you never know. Hire someone a different way today. <laughs> it's not monetized. It's just for enjoyment. So that's great. if exactly. you find a recipe you like, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Well, this has been On the Spot Career Talk, and I am thankful uh, for my friend, Dr. Patrick Chad, who has agreed to come on today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. It was really fun.